Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Brookings. I'm Michael Hamlin with the Foreign Policy Program, and it's my honor uh, to emcee this event with Congressman Seth Moulton today. Uh, Seth is beginning his third term in the 6th District in Massachusetts, uh, which includes his native town of Marblehead. He is, as many of you know, a four-time Iraq War veteran who joined the Marine Corps after graduating from Harvard and before that Phillips Academy, uh, studying physics at Harvard and deciding that with all that background, what he wanted to do most was serve his country, not knowing that 9-11 was just around the corner. Uh, I, I think many of us know about Seth's very important work in Congress. Uh, he's received awards for among the most effective, uh, I think the most effective freshman member a couple of years ago. Also, he's worked on issues such as getting veterans their health care faster, making government more efficient in seemingly mundane but important matters like travel. These are some of the bills and, and subject areas that he's worked on. He's been important, of course, in the last few months in kicking off a big debate in the Democratic Party or contributing uh, in a way that's often been controversial but I think admirable and necessary about what the party's priorities should be. And now he's even getting mentioned occasionally in the presidential speculation about 2020. And I'll leave it to you to decide if that topic comes up today. I'm going to focus more in my discussion with, with Congressman Moulton on national security. But first, he will give some uh, remarks to frame his thinking about the nation's defense priorities and foreign policy priorities in this important time as the Democrats now uh, take in charge of the House. And we have a need for a whole new uh, debate with new people and new voices. Uh, we all still mourn the passing of Senator McCain, which just underscores the importance of having new voices in the national security debate. And so let me just briefly add one more word of introduction before uh, the congressman starts with his remarks. I just want to add a word about how I first met him. I was lucky enough to be on a, a research trip to Iraq in the summer of 2007 with my good friend and colleague Ken Pollack. And Congressman Moulton, who I think was then on his third tour incoming, had been chosen by General Petraeus along with my good friend uh, Ann Gildroy, Ann Gildroy Fox now, to go and essentially do a small team deployment with just uh, one or two other Marines to an eastern Shia dominant province of Iraq where there was hope that perhaps some of the same Sunni awakening dynamics that had begun in Al-Anbar could be spread to other parts of the country. And Seth was ultimately involved in the so-called uh, March of the Knights or the effort to try to liberate Basra from many of the Shia militias, which was a crucial moment in the Iraq war in those following months. So Petraeus chose Seth and Anne Gildroy for this job because he recognized their bravery, their ability to deal at a military and a tactical level, but also at a strategic and a political level with the important Iraqi actors. And at this point, uh, uh, Seth Moulton is at the tender age of about 28 years old back in 2007. So this was an indication of just how much General Petraeus knew that he had a remarkable talent. And I was grateful to be able to spend uh, the better part of 10 days learning about Iraq with him uh, at my side and as my mentor. So please, without further ado, join me in welcoming Congressman Seth Moulton to Brookings. Mike, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be here with you. And uh, this weather we have today, this dreary, rainy day, is 100 times better than the average day in a in Iraq with the heat, so it's, it's, a, it's a nice change. Uh, thank you all so much for, for having me, and um, you know, I'll be brief with my remarks because I want to get to a discussion with all of you. Uh, but not too long ago, I was speaking at an advanced manufacturing facility up in my district, a place that actually made some of the gear that uh, my Marines and I used in Iraq. And a group about this size gathered on the factory floor, the factory workers who did this work, and I praised them for their contribution for our national defense. And then I opened it up to questions, and there was silence. And I implored them. I said, you don't have to ask easy questions. You can ask the hardest questions on your mind. Ask whatever you'd like. And there was still silence. And then finally, a woman in the back raised her hand, and she said, who are you? And so I realized that I should start with an introduction and explain a little bit about who I am, why I'm here, why I've signed up for one of the most unpopular jobs in the United States, U.S. Congressman, and what I'd like to speak about this morning. The reason I got into politics goes back to my time in the Marines. I decided to serve the country while I was in college. 
and I picked the Marines a few months after graduation in June of 2001. I had no idea that 9-11 would happen a few months after that, or that I'd sent, served four tours in the Iraq War. But while I was over there, I learned a lot that has helped make me who I am today. I came to much more deeply appreciate what we have here in America. A free press, law and order, individual rights have so much more meaning when you come to know people who don't have those things every day. I also realized that I loved serving, that having a job with a purpose bigger than myself meant a lot, and I enjoyed going to work every single day to serve our country. Even in the midst of a war I disagreed with, my work impacted the lives of other people every day. And fundamentally, that's what motivated me to get back into public service and to come to Congress. But there's a third lesson that I learned in Iraq that's a little bit harder to come to terms with. And that is what it means to feel let down, even betrayed by political leaders in Washington. Playing politics with war and foreign policy takes on a whole new meaning when you know some of the people who die as a result. We must do everything we can to prevent that from happening again. And that is why I care so much about our foreign policy and about moral leadership. And I've never been more concerned about both. Two years ago, in the early days of this administration, I gave a foreign policy speech called No Better Friend, No Worse Enemy, centering on three themes. We need to be a stronger ally to our key partners like NATO. We need to be a stronger adversary to our key foes like Russia. And to do so effectively, we need to embrace next generation defense technologies. That's very difficult for a young Democrat in Washington today to get the Trump administration to pay attention to anything you say. Even as one of the most bipartisan members of Congress, I haven't been in, even invited to the White House for a single meeting in the last two years. But the administration must have read my speech quite carefully because they have succeeded in these two short years of doing the exact opposite of everything I prescribed. The administration has alienated our allies, cowered to our key adversaries, and abandoned our alliances. In so doing, it has torn down the foreign policy values that two generations of American leadership built. In that earlier speech, I called for reassuring our allies and confronting our enemies more forcefully. Basically, I wanted to rebuild the foreign policy that we had before this administration. But now I realize that that's not possible. And inherent in this disaster is an opportunity. When your old house gets damaged by a bad renter, or in this case, a terrible president, you don't just restore it to look like it was built in 1950 you take the opportunity to renovate it. You don't just rebuild, you build something new, something more relevant, something better. That's what's required of our foreign policy today. To do so requires a re-examination of our assumptions and a regrounding in our core principles. In with the new and more difficult but as important, out with the old. This means recognizing the new arms and new alliances we need and the old weapons and old wars we don't. I'll focus on these three areas where we need next generation thinking, where we need newer, smarter, stronger arms, alliances, and arms control. First, our arms. There were times when I was fighting on the ground in Iraq at the pointy tip of the spear, as we like to say, and our insurgent or terrorist enemies were beating us on the internet. That was unacceptable then, and it's worse now. We have to stop fighting today's battles on yesterday's battlefields. Today we face great power competition from two adversaries like we haven't seen since the lead up to World War II. And we run the serious risk of being entirely leapfrogged by China and Russia with new technologies. China is not trying to compete with our 11 carrier Navy by building 12 or 13 or 14 of their own. 1,238, that's the number we should have top of mind. That is our best estimate for how many Chinese anti-carrier missiles you can buy for the price of one U.S. carrier. 
Here's another way to look at our colossal surface navy. I asked a CNO in a hearing a couple years ago, how many times have the Chinese attacked a U.S. carrier? Never, sir. How many times have the Chinese attacked us through the Internet? In the last 24 hours, sir? The punchline is this. We're investing 16 times more in carriers than in cyber. We need to reexamine that balance. And I'll also point out, with regards to the South China Sea, that it's a lot harder to sink an island than an aircraft carrier. We need to ask the same questions of our massive financial commitment to the F-35. I'm more worried about how soon we can field the F-45 or PCA, which may not be manned, and so on with the other services as well. I think Russia and China actually have an inherent advantage over us by being more budget constrained and less politically constrained by the military industrial complex. They don't have the luxury of trying to compete with our big, expensive legacy weapon systems. So they have to develop the smaller, cheaper, next generation weapons to defeat them. Having no real response to China's plan to be the world leader in artificial intelligence or AI by 2030 is unacceptable. We need to dramatically up our investment in autonomous, hypersonic, and cyber weapons to compete and win. We also need to ensure that we maintain the fundamental investments in our country that have always been critical to our national security, basic scientific research, education, and immigration. These policies have driven our defense dominance for a century, but today I'm worried. Paying for these investments will require us to make some hard choices about legacy weapon systems we can no longer afford. Second, I'd like to talk about arms control. While I feel we are woefully behind in making the commitment we need to next generation arms, at least we are starting to discuss it. I haven't heard anyone discussing next generation arms control at all. And here's why it's so important. Most people think of arms control as purely a way of making us safer by decreasing the number of weapons owned by everyone. But done well, arms control also makes us stronger by giving us a strategic advantage. For example, if the U.S. and Russia agree to comparable reductions in ICBMs, but our missiles are more accurate or more reliable, then we have the advantage. That is why I was such a strong advocate four years ago for a worldwide convention to limit the proliferation of drones. Back then, we were still far ahead of the rest of the world in that technology, and limiting them may have solidified that advantage. Now, this particular idea may or may not have worked, but the principle is one we need to pursue. Simply put, we need to start thinking of arms control not just with traditional weapons, but with new ones as well. Authoritarian regimes have an inherent advantage in developing AI weapon systems because, one, surveillance gives them much uh, bigger access to much bigger data sets, and two, they are not necessarily beholden to the same moral principles controlling their employment. Much sooner than later, we'd be wise to consider what kinds of arms control over autonomous weapons powered by artificial intelligence will make us safer. Third, alliances. This is where the analogy of the destructive house renter is most apropos and where an entire renovation is required. In the wake of Trump's handling of NATO, many will call for re-strengthening that alliance, and I am among them. But NATO was established under 1949 rationale. Just as we're not going to counter Russia's amazingly successful work at undermining democratic elections by simply refurbishing our nuclear arsenal, we need to rethink the strategic role and purpose of NATO. Now is the opportunity, presented to us ironically by this administration, to renovate and strengthen it for a new world. Likewise, we should be re-examining our troop commitments to places like Japan and Germany, and we should be asking whether it makes sense to establish a Pacific NATO to counter China. In the Middle East, as the war on terror approaches the two-decade mark, America's continued presence in Afghanistan and Iraq makes these the longest wars in American history, and the entire region is more disrupted and more disruptive than when we began. We attacked a grease fire with a pail of water, and now the entire kitchen is ablaze. There are nearly four times as many Sunni extremists in the world today 
as there were in 2001. And although the administration celebrates how little territory ISIS now controls, which is a near meaningless measure of an insurgency strength, Sunni extremists worldwide control more territory now than they did then. These facts compel serious questions about our continued strategy in the war on terror. Now, we can't simply abandon places like Syria without any plan, because as our experience in Iraq faithfully demonstrated, we'll just have to come back, and it will take more American lives to do so. But for all our wars, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and the many small wars beyond, we need clear and achievable missions approved by Congress and transparent to the American people so that our troops can fight for peace and know what they must achieve to come home for good. Just as we admire President Roosevelt for leading us into World War II, we should admire President Eisenhower for leading us out of Korea. Finally, climate change must be part of our thinking about alliances as well. Syria presents a particularly compelling example of how a conflict with origins in, so in, in social upheaval combined with the pressures of climate change as mounting evidence focuses, blames, focuses blame on the region's historic drought can quickly become a multi-dimensional war. Climate change won't wait, and neither should we. It's a threat to our national security. We obviously need to get back into the Paris Accord, but that isn't enough. The time to act is now, and new alliances to prevent it are a good place to start. In summary, it's time to completely reimagine our arms, our alliances, and our arms control for this new and rapidly changing world. All three are indispensable to meet the challenges of the new world order, which emphasizes the importance of an all-hands-on-deck approach to national security. Russia and China have embraced this. Terrorist groups embody it. But here in America, we have regressed. To meet the challenge of Sputnik, Congress made massive investments in education and basic scientific research. Today, this non-defense discretionary spending is politically divorced from our national defense, and ironically, a prime target for cuts by so-called congressional hawks. Yes, aircraft carriers fall under defense, but non-defense spending includes diplomats that help us avoid wars, USAID workers to tackle global health crises like Ebola, and FBI and DHS professionals who keep us safe, all critical to our national security. Too many times in Iraq, I was asked to fulfill diplomatic roles essential to our military mission, for which I was ill-equipped and never trained because our State Department was under-resourced. Last, I want to have one final word about the leadership that will be required to make these hard choices and new investments. In the immediate aftermath of the 2016 election, a general officer came to my office on Capitol Hill. And I asked him if he agreed with me that Russia was a great and present threat to our national security. He thought for a minute, and then he looked up and said, no, sir, I don't think it's Russia. His salty old Marine general paused again, and then he said, I think the greatest threat to our national security is the attack on our democracy right here at home. I didn't expect that answer, but he was right. And it brings new meaning to that same oath I swore as a Marine that I swore as a member of Congress, to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I'm heartened by the new leadership emerging in this country to meet this challenge, including more veterans in Congress than we've seen in a generation. But the mountain we have to climb is steep, the choices are hard, and the political fight will be severe. Just down the road in Quantico, Virginia, the Marine Corps taught me in 2002 about two kinds of courage good leaders need, physical courage and moral courage. In warfare, we usually think of physical courage, but many of the most difficult challenges I faced in Iraq required both. We count on our troops to be courageous in every respect. 
the only form of courage we need to find here in Washington is moral. Moral courage is often in short supply around here, but we need it to meet these tough challenges. Our troops deserve it, and our national security demands it. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.